1 Corinthians 13 this morning, as we ask this very important question, what is love? And if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hands. Our ushers will be happy to bring you a copy because we believe that God alone defines love. This morning, as we continue in our series under construction, we are asking that very simple question, what is love? Uh, There are some modern theologians that have taken a crack at it. The Beatles said, love is all you need. Meatloaf said he'd do anything for it, just not that. If anybody knows what that is, please tell me because I still can't figure it out. And the Trinidadian German R&B rap group Hadaway asked the right question, what is love? Because if you don't properly define it, then baby, you'll hurt me. And baby, don't hurt me. No more. It's the hit that keeps on hitting. What is love? This is an important question in our day and in our time and our culture because clearly, as you can see from the video, our world doesn't know, does not know how to define it. In fact, Google will tell us that it's the most asked question on the Google data search base. If the world doesn't know, that's concerning. What's even more concerning is that oftentimes Christians are very fuzzy on what it means to truly love. And what if it were possible for us to think and to believe that we are loving one another when we're actually hurting each other? You know, I can let my girls eat pizza and cupcakes and sugary snacks three meals a day and then never brush their teeth, go to bed whenever they want to, sleep in out however late they want to, but at the end of the day, they'll love me in the moment, but is that in the long run? the most loving thing for them. See, sometimes I think we can think we're loving each other when we're actually harming each other. Because Paul is going to show us here in this text, in chapters 13 and 14, that right things done with the wrong motivation can actually be very harmful. Right? He's going to show us here in this text that right things, such as the use of our spiritual gifts within the context of the church, used with the wrong motivation, without love in our hearts, can actually be very harmful. That's why we must, must, tell your neighbor must, we must properly understand how God defines love and why it is so important so that we will know how to properly use it. Are you with me? All right, let's begin with prayer. Father, this morning we come before you and we are so thankful uh, that not Not because we first loved you, but because you first loved us. By pursuing us, by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to pursue rebels, people that had turned their backs on you, people who cried out for Jesus' crucifixion. You chased us down. You pursued us, motivated by your love. And Father, Romans 5, 5 tells us that that is the love that you have poured into our hearts through the Spirit of God. So, Father, teach us to love because it's the most powerful force on the planet. It transforms lives. It changes destinies. It transforms communities. And, God, it comes from you. We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing we need to understand is that love must be the foundational motivation of all that we do. Verses 1 through 3, uh, begin with me in chapter 13. Verses 1 through 3 says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong, I'm a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith and so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. To give you some context as to what's going on here in Corinth, 
In Corinth, the people had been ranking the spiritual gifts in terms of importance. And some have been saying that if you had the prominent gifts in the prominent spiritual gifts, that made you basically a superhero in the church. And that if you had some of the lesser gifts in the church, that basically made you a janitor. And so there were clearly some people that were more important because of the gifts that they had and some people who were less important. Now, in God's eyes, that was wrong, but that's how the Corinthians viewed it. And what that was creating in the church was some people had this level of pride about the spiritual gifts that they had, and others were envious because of the gifts that they had. And this pride and this envy and this jealousy that was going on in the church had brought the church and its growth to a grinding halt. It had taken healthy relationships and turned them into stagnant cesspools of bitterness. And we must understand, church, that if love does not infuse everything that we do here as a body of Christ, everything that we are doing will come to a grinding halt without love. Amen? And so here's what Paul says. We're going to unpack it just verse by verse. The first thing that Paul says is gospel minus love is just annoying. Verse 1, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong, I'm a clanging cymbal. Now, during this time, uh, the gift of tongues had been given, uh, gave the ability to communicate the gospel to people without having to learn their language. So, in other words, if Mario and I speak a different language and I have the gift of tongues, all of a sudden I can speak Mario's language without having to learn it and therefore sharing the gospel with him, I further and I advance the gospel. But what Paul is saying here in this text, as important as the gift of tongues is, if it does not, if, if, if the foundational motivation of sharing the gospel through the gift of tongues is not love, I can say, Mario, you need Jesus. Mario, Jesus died on the cross. Mario, God loves you. Mario, you need. All you're going to hear if I don't have love is this. How appealing of a sound is that? And yet what Paul is telling us here is without love, even sharing the gospel in a miraculous way is just annoying. He also says here in the text in verse 2 that giftedness and using our spiritual gifts without love is emptiness. Verse 2 he says, and if I have the prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith as so as can remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. I mean, what a collection of spiritual gifts this person have. I, I mean, I would love to have that guy in our, in our church, amen? The guy that can like move mountains with faith, amen? That would be pretty cool. But here's the thing. We are very good. We are experts at measuring our value and importance in the church by what we can do. But God says that he measures our value and importance in the church by how much we love. Because, see, if we can do all of these miraculous gifts, but we have not love, we are nothing. I can go home and I can mow the lawn and do the dishes for my beautiful bride. I can change diapers every day of the week. I can run home from, from work and Miranda's got a diaper that needs changing. Not you, but <laughs> Izzy has a job, has a, well, I just train wrecked right there. Izzy has a diaper that needs to change. It. You, you get what I'm saying. I can do all this stuff. I can work 60 hours a week. I can do everything for my wife. But if I don't love her, I'm an empty shell of a husband. We can come here week in and week out, and we can do setup, and we can do teardown, and we can do um, uh, first touch ministries out in the parking lot and wave people in, and we can serve in the children's ministry, and we can go to the picnic this afternoon. But if we do not genuinely love each other, we're an empty shell of a church. See, God says, giftedness without love is emptiness. And then he also says here in the verse, uh, in verse 3, he also says that service and sacrifice without love is is nothing. In verse 3, if I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. I could be a missionary in a third world country. I could turn my life, I could pattern my life after Mother Teresa, and I could go to Calcutta and spend my life there. But if I don't have love, if I'm not driven and motivated and moved by this essential thing called love, I have nothing, and I gain nothing. 
What Paul is telling us here is that the foundational motivation of everything that we do as believers in Jesus Christ must be driven by this thing called love because if it's not, it will simply be a loud clanging symbol. It will be empty. It will amount to nothing. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things that can motivate me. An ideal, a dream, a desire for personal glory, earthly reward, pat on the back. These are all genuine motivators that oftentimes creep into my heart and get mixed in with my motivation of love. And what Paul is saying here is when these other motivations creep in and get mixed up with love, it can actually be very harmful for one another. And so let me ask you, what drives you to do what you do right now in your marriage, in your parenting? When you got up this morning and you decided to come into church, what is it that drove you to come here? Is it love? If you're anything like me, oftentimes it's a mixture of things, amen? That's why we have to come back to this thing called love. But this bigger question, of course, other than the foundational motivation of what we do is what is it? What is love? Well, Paul defines it in verse four. He says this, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable, it's not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And if you've been to a wedding in your lifetime, you have probably heard these verses. But to give you some context as to what Paul is writing into, uh, the city of Corinth existed just beneath a massive hill that lived or that was right behind the city. And up on this hill was what was called the Temple of Aphrodite. And many of the people in Corinth, when they worshiped, they would go to the Temple of Aphrodite and they would worship with the temple prostitutes. And so this idea of what love and worship looked like literally flowed down from the temple, from the hill into the city and infused every aspect of their culture. Does that sound familiar here in America? Is our culture similar to that of Corinth where everything about love is defined by sensuality? Can I get an amen? I think it's telling that in our culture, our culture is so defined by sensual love that Abercrombie and Fitch a couple of years ago quit printing the... um, how do I want to put this, the sensual imagery that they would use to promote their product, they quit doing that because they said it was white noise. Everybody advertises that way. And they said, if you want to stand out, you can't do that anymore. That just shows us how much our culture has lost its mind about this thing called love. And even in the Bible, the Bible describes love in four different ways. There's eros, It's the romantic love between a husband and a wife in a committed marriage. There's phileo, uh, the love that two friends have when they combine together and they have a mutual goal that they're trying to accomplish together. There's storge love, which is uh, the love that you have for an old sweater. It just makes you feel good when you put it on. But here in the text, Paul keeps using this word agape. And this word agape love is defined as self-sacrificing love love for another, for another's good. And in this text, what Paul is going to do is he's going to basically unpack for us what this self-sacrificing agape love looks like played out in a church where everybody's fighting with each other. And so here's the thing that I want to say about this. As we read through these words that describe agape love, the first thing that we need to understand is this is a description of how God loves us. Amen? This describes how God has loved you. And this is also a description of how you are to love each other and how I am to love you. But here's the other truth about this text. And this is a hard truth. What I'm about to describe to you you can't do. Ask me why. Because if I give you the description of these 14 words and I say, okay, go home 
and do this, and you start trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and trying to do all 14 things this afternoon, you're going to fall flat on your face, and you're going to realize, wow, I can't do this by myself. Why did Paul even put this in here? Why would he? If we can't do it by ourselves, then why would Paul put it in the text? Because here's the thing. Paul didn't put these 14 descriptions of agape love in the text to drive us to despair. He put it in the text to drive us to Christ who will love through us as we walk with him. Is that cool? Jesus wants to live through you, and this is what the love will look like when he is living through you. So let's get the description. Let's get a picture of what self-sacrificial love for another's good actually looks like. He says here in the text, love is patient. That is, love has a long fuse. It bears with the annoyances and inconveniences of another, and here's the key, without complaint. I can endure your annoyances and inconveniences, but it's really hard to do it without complaining. Because I want somebody else to know how hard I'm working to love you. But to do it without complaint, man, that's tough. It's kind. It is uh, unmerited, an, uh, kindness is an unmerited, favorable disposition toward another, whether you, you deserve it or not. I'm for you. Whether you deserve it or not, I'm for you. I am favorably disposed toward you, regardless of how you treat me. That's kindness. I want you to know that I love you. Here's another thing. It does not envy. In other words, you don't owe me because of what you have. You don't owe me. You might have more than me. You might be more blessed than me. You might have more stuff than me. You might have more going on in your life than me. And you know what? Because I'm not going to envy you, I'm going to rejoice with you that God is pouring out blessing after blessing upon you. I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to think in my mind, you owe me because of what you have. That's envy. But then he goes on to say here in the text that love does not boast, it is not arrogant. And that also means you don't owe me because of what I've done for you, right? You ever do something for someone and you're like, hey, I'm going to do this for you, but <laughs> you're going to have to pay me back. You ever been there? And you start keeping a tally list of all of the things that you've done for somebody, and then you think, in time, I'm going to cash that check and they're going to pay me back. That's pride, that's arrogance to think that somehow you owe me because, and love doesn't do that. Love's not rude. It considers the other person's feelings and concerns ahead of their own. It doesn't insist on its own way, it's reasonable. Love understands that there's more ways, more ways than one to skin a cat. Amen? I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to a really tired crowd here. This is love. Amen? This is the most exciting, most incredible thing that God would love us through sending his son on the cross to die for our sins. Can you believe that God would do that? The Bible is not boring. I hope I'm not making it boring. But does this get you on fire? To start loving God and loving one another? This should wake us up. Amen? So maybe, maybe I got to work at it here. Love's not irritable. It's not easily offended. It's not easily angered at the smallest perceived slight. Someone's walking down the hall, Josh, and we see each other, but I got a lot on my mind, and you say hi, and I don't say hi back, and you're not offended by the idea that I didn't say hi back. Maybe I'm having a bad day. Maybe I'm having a, I'm having a rough day, and you consider that. It's not irritable. Love is not resentful. Ooh. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. Is that one hard? Can I get a raise of hand of people that are just like, yeah, I really struggle with that. Actually, don't raise your hand. Um, I'll just raise mine. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, and yet I've, I, I can't tell you how many marital situations I've counseled where I come into the office and I ask what's wrong, and when we really get down to it, it's something that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. Love does not keep a record of wrong. Love does not rejoice in, uh, what does it say here in verse 6? It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. Love grieves 
as a result when it sees sinful action and choices, but love rejoices when it sees godly decisions and godly choices. Love bears, that is, that it protects the other person. I'm in this to watch out for your care, for your love, and specifically in this context, it means against gossip. Here's the thing about gossip. It's fun to spread and easy to listen to, right? <laughs> no one wants to amen that one. It's fun to spread, and it's easy to hear, and it destroys relationships. Love bears, it protects. Love believes the best in another person. It gives them the benefit of the doubt. Is it easy to get to a place where you don't want to give the other person the benefit of the doubt anymore? Love hopes. Love cannot grow when it's staring in the rearview mirror. When I'm constantly focused on what you did to me in my past rather than what God is trying to do in you for the future. It cannot grow. Love endures. It does not give up easily. These are 14 boundary markers of biblical agape love. And so let me ask you, how are you doing? Who got an A plus? Okay, good. Here's why. Because you can't do this yourself. You need a solid, close, intimate walk with Jesus who wants to do this for you and through you. And when he does, this is what that love will look like. And so maybe you're here today and you're struggling in your marriage. You're struggling in your parenting. I know I'm struggling in both of those. You're struggling in work. You're struggling in a relationship and whatever it looks like. What do you do? How do you do this? You get on your knees and you get before the Lord and you draw near to him and you abide in his presence. And as you do that, these things will begin to grow in you. Number three, and why, why are we making such a big emphasis on love? Well, here's the reason why. Because in the text, Paul says that love never ends. Love never ends. Look at what it says in verse 8. Love never, what? Never ends. And notice what it says here in verse uh, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. One day our faith is going to be sight. One day our hope is going to be realized. But for all of eternity, love will never end. Love is eternal. And what Paul is doing here is he's contrasting this to the temporary nature of spiritual gifts, which the people of Corinth had been fighting over. And so let's review what are the purposes and what is the purpose of a spiritual gift? Why do you have the gift of leading and whatever you have? Well, he says in verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 7, to each is given a manifestation of the spirit, that's a spiritual gift, for the common good. Chapter 14, verse 12, he says, So with yourselves, so eagerly, uh, so since you are eager for a manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. The purpose of your spiritual gifts is for the building up of one another, for serving one another, for loving one another. But what he's doing here is he's saying, look, at one point, this thing that you're fighting so much about, these spiritual gifts, they're going to end, but love never will. So strive to love each other. Amen? But it raises this interesting question that he actually addresses. When will spiritual gifts cease? Have you ever wondered that question? Like, when are they going to end? When are they going to cease? Has anybody else wondered that question? Or like, am I kind of in my ivory tower wondering this question myself? Am I that guy? Okay. When will they cease? And there's been a lot of debate over that. And we mentioned a couple of weeks ago that there's three main views. There are what are called the cessationists. And cessationists believe that gifts are not for today, or at least the miraculous gifts are not for today. A common teacher of that would be John MacArthur. He's a very popular teacher of that view. Another view would be called the charismatic view, and that would be that gifts are for today with great freedom. And a common or a, a popular teacher of that view would be C.J. Mahaney. And we love C.J. Mahaney, partnered with him through our Harvest Fellowship. Thankful for him. Thankful for John. But then there's a third view, and that's what's called the open but cautious. Gifts are for today, all of them, but with caution and the caution that Scripture applies. And John Piper, that's my boy, 
Uh, he is the primary teacher of that view. And so what is it? What is the primary view? Well, the view that we get is determined by what the Bible says. And we find our understanding of that in verses 8 through 12. So let's read that. It says here, Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, they will pass away. So clearly we see that Paul is emphasizing the temporary nature of gifts and the permanent nature of love. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now, most theologians agree that the partial here in the text is referring to spiritual gifts. But the question is, what does the perfect refer to? Because when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. So it says in verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I came a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, here's the key verse, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So when the perfect comes, the partial, that is spiritual gifts, will cease. What is the perfect? Now the disagreement is over. What does the perfect mean? Some people interpret that to mean at the completion of the New Testament, spiritual gifts will cease. Other people would say, when Jesus Christ returns, then spiritual gifts will cease. Do we have any clues in the text that would tell us one way or another? And by the way, are you all with me? This is kind of top shelf stuff, amen? All right, this is high level, but are you with me? This is important because it has implications as to how we do church, all right? So what does the perfect represent here? Well, as I study the text and as I look at it, it's either the completion of the New Testament or it's the return of Christ. If it's the completion of the New Testament, then spiritual gifts are over. If it's the return of Christ, then spiritual gifts are continuing for today. And as we look at the text, the way I read the text, and I know that there are smarter people who read it differently than me, and so I'm open to that, and I know that I'm not the smartest uh, guy in the room, but this is how I read it, that when I see from now on, or, or verse 12, for now we see it a mirror dimly, but then face to face, that is referencing when we see Jesus face to face, okay? Look at all the relational language that Paul is using here in the text. For now we see it a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. For I know Jesus in part, but then I shall know him fully, even as he fully knows me. Half a dozen times, uh, half a dozen references in the Old Testament refer seeing God face to face. Revelation 22, verse 4, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 tell us that when we see Jesus and he appears, we're going to see him what? Face to face. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 even indicates that gifts are given until the return of Jesus. And so as I look at this, this is why we call ourselves open open but cautious when it comes to the spiritual gifts because we see here in the text that they are for us, all of us, until Christ returns. But here's the bigger point. Maybe you're here this morning and would say, well, I'm not sure I agree with that. That's totally cool. And here's why. Because love is more important than our spiritual gifts. The bigger point is that gifts one day, they will cease. When is open for debate, but love will never cease and that is not open for debate. And so a couple of applicational points for us as we think through how we believe or how we hold on to these debatable issues, a couple of thoughts here. The application is we need to have a humble orthodoxy. And what do I mean by that? If you go to the orthodontist, they're trying to do what to your teeth? They're trying to straighten them out, right? That's what you do at the orthodontist. And so to have right, to have straight belief system. And so how do we have a humble orthodoxy? Well, we have to distinguish between primary issues and secondary issues. A primary issue is a belief which we hold with a closed hand. It's important to Christianity as a whole. If we don't believe it, Christianity falls apart. But a secondary issue is an issue that we can believe with an open hand. It's open for debate. There are people who are smarter than us who disagree with us on these issues. Now, some of the primary issues might be like this. Um, we might call some of the primary issues... Uh, biblical authority, uh, the Trinity, uh, deity of Jesus Christ and the virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
his second coming. These are primary issues that are not open for negotiation. They are closed-handed, and all God's people said, Amen. all right. But here are some secondary issues that Christians love to just fight over, and I don't know why. Color of the carpet, and no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Although that's not too far from the truth. Timing of Jesus' return, church government and church government styles, baptismal mode, Election, that's a big one, and even spiritual gifts. And what Paul is telling us here is this. We can disagree and still love each other. Now, love doesn't mean that we ever check our minds at the door. It just means that we can have unity without uniformity. We don't have to all agree. But can we agree that there are better things to fight over than spiritual gifts? Can we agree that Jesus Christ is building his church? Can we agree that God has gifted all of us? Whether you don't believe in any spiritual gifts, God has either gifted or programmed you or designed you or however you want to paint it, how, whatever you want to call it, God is building his church through us and he wants us to be about loving each other rather than fighting over our particular views of spiritual gifts. Can we all get on board with that? Amen. Amen. And that's why Paul is saying, look, at some point, these spiritual gifts are going to cease, but love never will. So never, ever stop loving each other. There's a world out there that needs the gospel that we believe. And they're not going to get it if we're fighting with each other over spiritual gifts. Now, we're going to enter into chapter 14. I know that today is a bit teaching heavy. And that is because these are some of the most debated, most argued over, most fought over chapters in all of Scripture. But it's important that we walk through them verse by verse so that we know what we believe and why we believe it. Amen? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a flyover in chapter 14. And the reason is this is very situationally specific to Corinth. And so we're not going to be able to answer every question because we've got about 10 minutes left. But what I want to do is um, show you that love is meant to govern how we use our gifts. Now, in the text, this is where we get the cautious part of open but cautious, okay? And love tells us that we're not free to use our gifts however we want to. Now, to give you some context here, tongues were being abused within the church, and they were hurting the church's witness. It says that in verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders are unbelievers or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? And so whatever way they were doing this, it was clearly giving the wrong impression to the world that was coming in. And so Paul is going to give some boundaries for how they use this very controversial gift called tongues. Now, maybe you're from a charismatic movement and you've never heard this preaching on chapter 14. This would be very new for you. Maybe you come from a very conservative background and you've never heard anybody preach on the use of tongues. Well, here we go. Buckle up. Amen. It's going to be fun for everybody involved, right? All right. So love governs gifts, our gifts, and how we use them in eight particular ways. And the first is this. Gifts are for the benefit of the whole, not the part. Gifts are for the benefit of other people, not for yourself. Verse 1, it says this, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And I'm going to read a long chunk here. For one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men but to God. For one, no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to the people and their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in the tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you to all speak, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, the brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not have distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, uh, who will be ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, 
How will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. Verse 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Wow, there's a lot there. I think to summarize that, because we don't have a lot of time left, I would say this, that during this time, many people in the church of Corinth were speaking in tongues, but without interpretation. And because of that, many of the people who were present to hear the gospel were being confused. And so what Paul is saying here is this. If you speak in tongues and nobody interprets, all you're doing is building up yourself and your spiritual gift isn't for you. Hear me, church, in this. Wherever you're at in this issue, your spiritual gift is not for you. It is for the building up of other people. And if you're using it only to building up yourself, then you are abusing your gift and you're hurting other people. Your gift is not for your own benefit. I think that's the summary point of those 19 verses. But then Paul also gives some further instructions on how to use tongues properly in the church. And he says this, tongues are a primarily a sign for unbelievers, not believers. And we find this in verse 21. I'm going to back up to verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. And the law is written, By people of a strange tongue and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders, uh, an outsider or an unbeliever enters, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he's called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Is that not ultimately what we want people to do when they come into the church of Jesus Christ? They want, they, we want them to know God is here, okay? But that can't happen if we're using our spiritual gifts for ourselves. And so what Paul is telling us here in this text is that the primary use of spiritual gift of tongues is for the sake of unbelievers. But he also says in verse 26, we're walking through this quickly. You still with me? Everybody hanging on? Is this helpful? Okay. Verse 26 says, is it only then for unbelievers? Is it for other people? We answer that question, verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up the church. So he also says tongues are for the edification of the church, but they must be interpreted. Now, there are a lot of people who will say there's different kinds of tongues, and there may be. I don't have any uh, clarity on that this morning, but I will say this. Whatever the tongue is being spoken in the context of the church, it requires interpretation for the building up of the body. But then we also see in verse 27, Paul gives a few more instructions on the use of tongues in the church. He says this, uh, no more than three can speak in tongues at a single gathering. So it says in verse 27, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three and in each turn. And this was to prevent undue prominence being given to one gift over another. And why is he saying that? Because we all have gifts and we want, we don't want to elevate the importance of one gift over another. Everybody matters in the life of the church. Say everybody. 
So that was weak. Say everybody. Everybody matters in the life of the church. And here's another uh, uh, a boundary that he gave for the speaking in tongues. Only one person at a, time, at a time, verse 27, and each one in turn. In other words, he was wanting to make sure that edification and encouragement was the focus, not confusion. And then he also says, someone must interpret what's said, latter half of verse 27, and let someone interpret, verse 28, but if there is no one to interpret, let each one of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. And that's where a lot of people will get the idea of a private prayer language. And if you believe in that, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm not sure what I think about that at this point. I'm still working on that. I'm tr still trying to understand God's word, but that's what we all ought to be doing. We all ought to be studying God's word to know what we believe for ourselves. Amen? That's what we should be doing. But if you have a private prayer language, praise God for that. But verse 28, he says, someone has to interpret. Now, here's an interesting point. We're going to skip down to verse 34, and everybody's going to kind of scratch their heads at this one. The latter half of verse 33, um, as in all of the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And all God's people said, what? <laughs> well, because clearly, if, if that is just a cut and dry issue, we've been violating that because we have women in our church leading in all sorts of different capacities. We have women directors and, and basically they're kind of like deacons and we have women teachers in the back and we have women awesomely leading our church in worship and we have women that come up and do announcements and pray for our church and we have women that teach women. What is Paul talking about here? Well, if we were to back up to 1 Corinthians 11.5 and we're not going to go there for sake of time, we would find that uh, Paul acknowledged there were women in the congregation prophesying openly, and he did not rebuke them from doing so. And so what is he saying here in the text? What are they not to speak to? My understanding is that in the context of quizzing people who gave prophecy in the church, they were not to be involved in the quizzing because that implied authority through the use of the word of God. And so that, in conjunction with 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, where women are to be, uh, to have, uh, men are to be the elders in the church and to teach men, that gives us clarity around what this probably means. Do you see why I just love tough texts? This is just tough stuff, amen? Does that make sense? I didn't hear a lot of yeps on that one. Okay, we'll come back to it. But here's another thing. Um, the final boundary is confusion and disorder was an indication that something was not coming from God. And verses 29 through 33 says this, let two or three prophesy, prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent for you can all prophesy one by one. So here we got that context of prophecy and women and how they interact with that so that they all may learn and all be encouraged. And the, spirits, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Look down at verse 36. Or was it for you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. In other words, if you're a prophet truly, then you're going to know that the word of God is true. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized as a true prophet. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. That's interesting. But all things should be done, here it is again, decently and in order. That is exactly why Paul is giving all of this because love should limit the way we do things so that we have order and design and intentionality in the church so that when people from the outside coming in, they can see Jesus, not us. That's the point of chapter 14. And there is a lot of stuff in there that I encourage you to go back and study for yourself. But the point of chapter 14 is people need to see Jesus, not how awesome our spiritual gifts are. So what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> 
A couple of things. Maybe you've been here and um, maybe you're hearing all of this teaching on speaking in tongues and you're asking the question, well, does this mean we're going to start speaking in tongues in the church and what is that going to look like? And look, if you've been comfortable at our church up to this point, you're going to continue to be comfortable. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Maybe you're saying, well, um, I just feel weird that we're putting the Holy Spirit in a box. Well, Let's just make sure that if it's a box that the Holy Spirit inspired, we're obedient to it. Does that make sense? Because it's the Spirit of God that inspired this text, amen? Um, So let me back up from the issue of spiritual gifts and specifically on tongues, and let's get some broader application out of all of this talk about spiritual gifts, which can be very controversial. How do we properly apply this wherever we are? Here's the thing. You've got skills, so use them. You've got spiritual gifts, so use them. And let love motivate you to use them. And how can you tell the difference whether you're serving because you are selfish or you're serving because you genuinely love? Here are some very good indications. If you're serving because you're you're selfish and driven by sin, here's what it'll look like. You serve and use your gifts for eye service and man's applause, you love the pat on the back. Is that clear? Secondly, you'll tend to have a judgmental, complaining, and murmuring spirit and attitude as you serve. And that is very clear. Number three, you'll self-pity, you'll have self-pity and a lack of contentment when you don't get the credit you think you deserve. When you have that going on in your spirit and in your heart, you will know that love is not really guiding what you do and driving what you do. But when love is driving what you do, when you serve, this is what it will look like. You will know in your heart of hearts, serving others is the same as serving Christ. I'll be teachable, I'll be flexible, and I'll be hopeful in my attitude. I might look at the ministry as it is. I might look at other people as they are, and I might know, brother, you're not everything that you're supposed to be. But praise God, because you're not everything that you once were. And praise God, God's still working on you. And here in the church, we're not everything that we're supposed to be. We're not everything that we once were, but God is still at work in our church. And that means we're hopeful and we're teachable and we're flexible when we use our spiritual gifts. And then finally, there's a wise application of our gifts in any situation we find ourselves in. Whether we're serving in children's ministry, whether we're out in the parking lot, where we're setting up in here, there is a wise application of our spiritual gifts in all situations. Amen? That's what love ultimately will look like. My hope and my prayer this morning is that all of us will seek to use the gifts that God has given us for the good of others and for God's glory, and to that end that the world may see and savor Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for helping us through this text, and thank you, God, for the gifts that you have given, but more importantly, for the love that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Thank you that you have given us the spirit of God that indwells us. And I pray, God, that he would continue to unify our church in this thing called love. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.